Hello there, my tasty little advertising goblins. Between the years 1517 and 1522, a young man by the name of Bernal Diaz del Castillo sailed from the newly established Spanish colony of Cuba on several expeditions. And, uh, you might not know him. Because he wasn't Ponce de Leon, nor Hernan Cortez, nor Christopher Columbus, Diaz was never in charge of these expeditions, but he was there. He was there from the initial contact between Spanish and Aztec subjects, all the way to the fall of the Aztec Empire itself. Of course, many men would go on to write about Cortez's conquest of the Aztecs in the decades after it happened. This pissed Diaz off, because, according to him, uh, they were wrong. They either lied for personal gain, or did shoddy work and made continuous and egregious errors in their writings. So, in his 80s, Diaz sat down in his twilight years to record what he experienced, and I think it's the coolest book I've ever gotten. Because he wasn't a historian, nor was he an accomplished general bragging about his great deeds, he was just an old soldier, and he wrote like one. He talked about the big historical events, and the quality of the bread on the ships. He talked about the social structures of the native tribes, and the politics of who got to lead the expeditions. I have five stories today, from his account. I have a spooky story, a story about axes, a story about oranges, a story about a dog, and a story about an animal that ate gold. And each one is more insane than the one before it. The first fun fact I have to share with you about Spanish colonization is that the Spanish had a thing for gold. All right, number four. I'm being sarcastic, obviously. If you know anything whatsoever about the Spanish and their colonies in the New World, you know the three G's. Which was disappointingly not a rap trio from the 90s. Guns, God, and Gold. While camping at the mouth of Tonala River, the Spanish noticed that many natives wore intricate and decorated gold axes on their hip. Of course, the natives eagerly traded beads for them, and the Spanish ended up with around 600 of these axes. It's quite the haul, huh? Of course, Spanish law at the time was that the crown received one-fifth of all New World treasure. This was known as the Royal Fifth. However, upon returning to Cuba with the axes and giving the Royal Fifth of Axes to the tax inspector there, he started laughing. Yes, while you obviously knew about the Spanish love for gold, what you may not actually have known was that they sometimes had a hard time identifying it. Every single one of those 600 axes were made out of copper. Yes, pure gold is easy to spot, it's soft enough you can leave teeth marks in it, but gold that has been poorly refined can often resemble bronze or even copper. You know, I don't even know why the Spaniards left the Old World. I mean, the Old World had it pretty good. You wanna plow a field? Well, they got an animal for that. Want a tasty omelet? Oh yeah, they got an animal for that too. Oh no. Oh, your nipples are almost blue. Yeah, you got some chilly nips, don't you? <sighs> Shave this weird goat. It'll help you in your, in your chilly little nips. Oh, or even worms. You can get a shirt made out of worm barf, provided you've got the money for such a fine luxury. <clears throat> worms, birds, bovines, my God, they were living large. Let me tell you, I don't know much about history, but I bet that everything was great from start to finish. The old world had mind-boggling access to animals for domestication, and these animals would shape how we ate and dressed and traded and built for millennia. But of course, what is the strength of an ox, the speed of a horse, the tender juiciness of a chicken, compared to... Who's that Pokemon? It's... <laughs> Now don't worry, don't worry. It does in fact spit. It spits everywhere. It's like its only thing. It just spits. Oh yeah, and guinea pigs. That the, the, the Native Americans had guinea pigs. Yeah, that was it. You can't have a cow unless you at some point had an aurochs. You can't have a chicken unless you at some point had a jungle fowl. Now there used to be horses in the Americas during the Ice Age, however. 
Uh, but, you know, un un unfortunately, they were delicious. So, you know, they're gone now. That happens. But, of course, I'm ignoring the big one. They had dogs. There are, in fact, many breeds who are originally from the New World. These dogs were as specialized as our own. The natives had breeds for hunting, as well as herding, and, well, eating. Listen, it's that or the guinea pigs, you gotta eat. But what I would like to discuss is one of the dogs the Spanish brought on their expedition. While anchored in a natural harbor for three days, the Spanish disembarked to forage for provisions. And Bernal Diaz wrote this about the occasion. Follow deer and rabbits abounded in the neighborhood, and with one greyhound, we killed ten of the former, and great numbers of the latter. Our dog took such a liking to this spot that it ran away while we were busy re-embarking. Nor did we see it again until we visited this place with Cortez, when the dog appeared in excellent condition, quite plump and sleeky. So, for about a week now, I've been thinking about the greyhound that went native and got fat. I like to imagine him on some Hearts of Darkness shit. Like literally the, the, the analogs with Marlon Brando, it's, it's too significant to ignore. That greyhound absolutely became the chief of a tribe of cannibalistic native chihuahuas, I promise. The best historical sources are, of course, unbiased. I look forward to the day we find such a source, because obviously no such thing uh, exists or can exist. Uh, once we get an AI historian, maybe, you know, like maybe he'll be unbiased, you know, after he kills us for all we've done. Due to the unfortunate nature of existence, the best sources are not unbiased, but rather openly biased. Plutarch had an agenda. Right? Like he had guys he liked and guys he didn't, and he was real big on using history to teach moral lessons. So they've all got a sort of after-school special vibe. Roman, your foolish invasion of our proud nation was a greedy folly, and now we shall pour the molten gold you crave so much down your ravenous throat. So, do you have any last words? Being greedy is bad. That's right. And what do we say when we do something bad? I'm sorry. Here's the thing. From my limited experience so far with Bernal Diaz, he is biased. Openly and obviously. So you gotta be careful with some of the shit that he says. This shit in number three I'm about to tell you could have been fake or exaggerated. But it has been corroborated with archaeological evidence and also humans are horrible. Upon finding three small islands off the coast of modern-day Veracruz, the Spanish disembarked in rowboats to investigate them. These three islands were all uninhabited, but upon one, the Spanish found two stone buildings of good workmanship, each with a flight of stairs leading up to a kind of altar. And on those altars were evil-looking idols, which were their gods. Here we found five Indians who had been sacrificed to them on that very night. Their chests had been struck open and their arms and thighs cut off, and the walls of these buildings were covered with blood. The Spanish chose to name the island simply the Island of Sacrifice, a name which it still holds to this very day. Now here's the thing that's really messed up about the Island of Sacrifice. It's your next vacation destination! Kayak to Isla de Sacrificios and discover the Veracruz Reef Park while you snorkel around the island. Enjoy the beautiful blue ocean as you meditate upon man's seemingly natural and universal predisposition towards ritualistic human sacrifice. Book your trip to the Island of Sacrifice today. This history lesson is brought to you by the Mexican Board of Tourism. Mexico! All that separates you from the darkness from whence we crawled bloody and screaming is one night in the jungle. Italy. Without tomatoes. Oh! Ew! Dude! What the fuck? Is it even still Italy without the tomatoes? Is it still Ireland without potatoes. In case you were wondering, the ancient Romans' favorite condiment was a disgusting fermented fish paste, by the way. But yes, the Columbian Exchange, the process by which crops, animals, diseases, and people began moving from one world to another was a fascinating one. 
We have countless records of interesting reactions Eurasians had to these New World crops. From the initial assumption that tomatoes were poisonous, to the pineapple becoming a decorative status symbol. Listen, if you get a time machine, don't bother killing Hitler. That problem takes care of itself. Just go get 100 pineapples from Walmart, travel to 1700 Austria, and marry a Habsburg. I know she'll have a weird chin, alright, but you gotta get over it, because if you play your cards right, one of your incompetent descendants can get embarrassed by Napoleon. Of course, we have fewer records of how the natives reacted to many old world crops and livestock, but thanks to Bernal Diaz, we know what happened. The exact moment oranges were introduced to the American mainland. I think. The next earliest claims I can find of oranges on the mainland were planted by Ponce de Leon, who planted them in Florida in 1521, several years after this story. While the Spanish were docked at the mouth of the Tonala River, trading lots and lots of worthless beads for lots and lots of worthless copper axes, many of the Spanish were sleeping on a hill next to a temple. Bernal Diaz was among these men, and he planted orange trees upon the hill. The trees took root really well, and the Indian religious leaders of the area saw that these were different plants than any they knew. They protected them, and watered them, and kept them free from weeds. All the oranges in the province are descendants of these trees. I know that people will say these old stories have nothing to do with my history, and I will tell no more. This part of Diaz's manuscript was, uh, actually crossed out, and I find the entire thing inexplicably adorable. I've observed that before beginning to write their histories, the most famous chroniclers compose a prologue in exalted language in order to give luster and repute to their narrative and to whet the curious reader's appetite, but I, being no scholar, dare not attempt any such preface. For to properly extol the adventures that befell us, and the heroic deeds we performed during the conquest of New Spain, would require eloquence and rhetoric far greater than mine. As you can tell from what I just read, it's sort of a self-conscious text. It rapidly sine waves between indignant rage at the lies of others and insecurity that Diaz himself lacks the writing ability to capture the incredible things that he's seen. There was a moment in Guatemala centuries ago where an old man that had fought the Aztecs in bloody battle sat down to write about it and tell his side of the story but he got lost in his memories, and trailed off, and wrote about that time he planted orange trees at the mouth of a river during a quiet moment. And then he caught himself and got self-conscious and imagined some fancy book-learning, history-writing nerds laughing at his little orange story, so he crossed it out and got back to the wild adventure. I like your story about the oranges, Senor Diaz, and I'm really glad that you wrote it. The stories I've shared with you today have been stories from Diaz's first two expeditions, which explored the coast of Mexico, and particularly the Yucatan Peninsula. The first expedition was fraught with constant Indian attacks, but the second one was more peaceful. Both expeditions, however, were fairly modest in size and found gold. A lot of gold. And a people who seemed to not really care that much about it. In fact, according to Bernal Diaz, there was a standing order from King Montezuma of the Aztecs that any Aztec subject coming into contact with the Spaniards should trade all the gold they have for beads. Of course, the Aztecs and their subjects were certainly familiar with gold. I mean, it was pretty and soft, so it could be easily worked into jewelry, which was their main use for it. But still, I mean, you couldn't eat it. You you couldn't make it into tools or weapons, except in, in Minecraft. But every politician is dead in Minecraft. It's a fantasy world. It was on Bernal Diaz's third expedition, the expedition led by Hernan Cortez, that would spell the end of the Aztec Empire. The Aztecs could not eat gold. They could not fuck gold. They could not live in gold. But Cortez could do all of those things to gold. That was all he'd ever done. That was the only existence. He could imagine. In Eurasia and Africa, gold had been money for millennia, even before the development of coinage by the Lydians. Hammurabi's code makes fines payable in the form of silver and gold. Gold wasn't gold. Gold was everything you could ever need. 
the difference between a life of unimaginable pleasure or death of starvation. History is the study of the effect of time on the human animal. History shapes how humans speak, what humans speak of, what humans think, how they look, how they fight, how they die, and what they're willing to die for, and even how they will be buried. We are over the event horizon. The human race is no longer just another animal, shaped by its genetic sequence and its immediate natural environment. We are all the same species, but time, geography, culture, conflict, and circumstance has made us very different animals with very different behaviors. Time had shaped Hernan Cortez into an animal that ate gold. When the Aztecs had a chance to ask Hernan Cortez, why do all you Spaniards love gold so much? Cortez responded, we Spaniards know a sickness of the heart that only gold can cure. If you enjoyed our time together, I encourage you to subscribe. I mean, you don't want to miss the video, right? The video where you see just how hungry Cortez was.